And now, off to Georgie to talk about self-driving cars. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Georgie Box. I'm a systems engineer. Um, for the last seven years I've been working in sustainable transport. Um, so my talk is all about the automation paradox in transportation. What is the automation paradox? Uh, well, on the one hand, we've got unprecedented acceleration in automation across all sectors, not just transportation. Um, it's not a new thing for humans to automate. We've been trying to do that uh, for a long, long time. Um, but with the advent of machine learning and artificial intelligence, we're now not only able to automate tasks and processes, um, but decision making as well, um, which has led to whole new use cases um, in automation. It's not just a nice to have anymore though. Um, we will need automation um, as we have an aging population in the UK um, and as more people exit the workforce and less people enter it, um, we'll need to automate more tasks to be able to have the goods and services that we're used to. Um, on the other hand, we need to reduce carbon emissions. Hopefully I don't need to convince any of you here of that, just <laughs> Rishi Sunak. Um, and we need to do that in an accelerated form as well. And there's this assumption um, that this is a lovely virtuous cycle, that the more we automate, the more efficient we become, and the more we can reduce our carbon emissions, and they go hand in hand. However, when you automate things, you become more productive, you can consume more, you've got more free time to spend doing things that may be producing more carbon emissions. Um, so actually, it, there's no way of knowing that that's a, a virtuous cycle. In transport, um, we, we really need to reduce carbon emissions. It's now the UK's leading emitter of carbon. Um, it's responsible for around 30% um, of our carbon emissions. Um, that's higher than the energy sector, agriculture industry, any other sector. Um, and self-driving cars have been hailed as one of the ways in which we can get there a lot faster. So in this presentation, I'm just going to look at what the assumptions are behind that and whether we can believe them. So just to introduce connected autonomous vehicles for those that might not be <coughs> familiar with what they are, um, there's three key components to uh, a CAV, a connected autonomous vehicle, self-driving car, driverless car, robo-taxi, uh, whatever you'd like to call them. Uh, the first is the connectivity, so that's that cars can share data with each other um, and with the infrastructure around them. So that means they can be more efficient because they can predict the future. Uh, is that, that traffic light might be on red now, but it'll be on green by the time I get to it, so I don't need to slow down. Um, the autonomy side um, is a sliding scale. Um, it's between level zero and level five, and most cars today are level one. So they've got some level of automation. Um, that's usually automated braking in an emergency um, or cruise control. Um, your Tesla um, autopilot is level two, so that means that they can um, do automated steering and lane assist, um, as well as matching the speed of the car in front. To get to driverless, we need to be at level four or level five. Um, and that means that the driver no longer has responsibility for safety inside that vehicle. Um, and you can be doing whatever you like um, instead of driving. And the vehicle side, um, this is a lovely Toyota Prius, but um, it could look um, very different to this. We don't know. Uh, it doesn't need a steering wheel. It doesn't need um, someone to be looking at, um, in the direction of travel. So they may look very, very different to that when we see them on the roads. The road to automation and the road to decarbonisation, um, if you ask the automotive sector, they'll talk about three key stages. Um, connected autonomous vehicles are not just a thing, they are kind of processes along the way. And there are three key components that they will say will help um, to reduce uh, carbon. First is electrification, um, then automation and sharing. So I'm going to go through each of those in turn and, and look at what that could do to the carbon emissions compared to a vehicle today. So electrification, um, to understand this properly, we need to look at the full carbon life cycle and not just the tailpipe emissions, which get all the press um, and where the main focus um, for decarbonisation comes from. Um, there are three key stages. The first is the manufacturing phase, um, and that is um, uh, any carbon from raw material extraction, the fabrication of the vehicle itself, um, production, and then getting it to uh, the forecourt where you would drive it away. 
The use phase is completely dependent on how much you use it. Um, we tend to look at a life cycle of a vehicle having 150,000 <coughs> kilometers or around 10 years of use for, for a private owner. Um, and then the end of life, which is where you dispose of the vehicle. Again, it's a one-off cost um, associated with landfill or recycling. And when you break it down for a typical petrol vehicle um, in 2021, you can see that around a third of it, um, about 30% is actually the embedded carbon, the manufacturing cost. Um, then the use phase, which is the majority, that's the tailpipe emissions. Um, that's what um, leads to poor air quality as well. And end of life is quite a small amount. When we go electric, um, if and when, um, you will see that um, a typical vehicle of similar size has a huge reduction in, in carbon emissions. And um, you'll see headlines saying that electric vehicles are worse for the environment, they've got these batteries that are really um, energy intensive to produce, um, and that's true, and you can see that manufacturing cost has really risen um, for, that, for that battery. Um, and that is due to the mining and production of batteries. Um, but the use phase has really shrunk, um, and that's where the focus is, and that's actually the only bit that we measure when we're talking about transport emissions. So it's really important to, to look at where those carbon emissions have gone. They've probably gone um, to China, to Germany, to somewhere where they're producing a lot more cars than we do. Fast forward to 2050, um, and the story gets a little bit better because our energy grid is only going to get more sustainable. We get more wind turbines, more solar, um, and so we can really reduce that use phase to almost nothing. So every mile that we drive is not really adding much in terms of the carbon life cycle, um, but what we've got to do is try and create as many miles as possible um, to reduce the impact of that manufacturing. So that gets us to a certain level, but by 2050, we need to be net zero. We need to get that as low as possible. Um, and automation is maybe part of the journey, um, and there are things that automation does that will help to, to reduce that a bit further. The first is better driving characteristics. Um, machines don't tend to try and show off to their friends. They don't try and tend to um, accelerate and do donuts in car parks. Um, so that will reduce uh, the use face emissions. Also then leads to fewer collisions. Um, and you might have a smaller powertrain, a smaller engine, a smaller battery, a smaller motor, because you uh, yeah, don't need to do zero to 60 in three seconds because the automated vehicle is not going to do that for you. On the other hand, though, um, if we've got a computer driving for us, um, then we need to make that. Uh, that requires more materials, that requires more energy to run, and that might lead to bigger batteries so that we can actually still have some range to move the, the vehicle. Automated vehicles open up a whole new world of new demographics for those that can't have a driver's license. Um, so elderly, young people that are not yet able to drive, those are disabilities that would allow them to not drive at the moment. And that increases demand for car travel and may move people away uh, from public transport modes. If you're not driving, what else are you going to be doing? Um, you might be reclining, you might have a massage chair, you might be watching films. All of these things are going to add weight to the vehicle, they're going to add energy consumption. Um, and so we're moving away from helping to do anything good in terms of carbon. And we also introduced the concept of empty miles. Um, we have some empty miles now, so that would be things like dropping kids off at school and then driving back again, and you didn't need to make that journey. Um, but with automation, you might have um, the car drop you off where you want to go and then circle around until you're ready to be picked up because you don't want to pay for parking, or it might travel 10 miles to go and find somewhere cheaper to park. Um, and all of these things add additional use um, to that vehicle which isn't actually helpful in our transportation needs. So overall, it's not looking that good. Um, <laughs> um, but that sort of takes us to the third element, which is sharing. Um, and there are two key types of sharing. Um, the first is time sharing. That's sort of um, like your, your zip car. So you have one vehicle which is shared by many users, but crucially not at the same time. So one person can complete a journey followed by the next person. Um, the alternative is occupancy sharing. Um, so James Corden and Adele here. Um, they are, instead of making the same journey in two different cars at the same time, um, they have consolidated that into one vehicle. So just a reminder in terms of what we're trying to do. Um, 
if we need to reduce the um, manufacturing um, costs, and this is per kilometre travelled, um, we want to reduce the number of vehicles that we're manufacturing or the rate of um, manufacture of vehicles so that we can really um, try and get that lower than it is now. Time sharing. Um, so in this example, you've got these three people who have decided to give up their cars um, and they will just opt to share the same car but at different times. Um, and what that does over the 150,000 kilometer lifespan um, is that the first person will use the car and then they'll pass it to the second person who will pass it to the third person. And you've done three times the mileage in the same car, it's reached its lifespan and you're gonna have to replace it. So you do that again, they buy another car, they go, not to worry, we're still saving so much money. Um, oh no, it's died again and we need a new one. Um, and so actually with time sharing, what you find is the rate of replacement is exactly the same. You have got a higher utilization of the same vehicle, which is good because you've only got one car on the road at any one time, um, and that's better for land use, um, but it's not really much better for reducing our embedded emissions. How about occupancy sharing them? <coughs> so these three people have um, decided, oh, we all go to work at exactly the same time. And not only that, we go to the shops at the same time. And we go to the cinema at the same time. We're actually inseparable. Um, they've decided to share a collection autonomous vehicle too. And so each time they travel, they travel together. Um, and so by the end of uh, the life um, of three vehicles that they would have used before, they've only got through one vehicle. So not only have they taken two cars off the road, off the production line, but they've also taken 300,000 kilometers um, of usage away as well. So it's a double win for occupancy sharing. Um, this is why public transport is so much better um, than private transport. It's why private jets are so much worse than commercial flying. Um, when we divide the demand by, um, by the uh, people, it, it really, really starts to improve things. So you can feel very smug about yourselves if you came here by public transport. <laughs> um, sure, many of you did. And if you didn't, then find someone to go home with. <laughs> <laughs> One of the reasons, I mean, we can share now. Um, it's completely possible to share, and we don't really. Um, and there's a key reason why connected autonomous vehicles might help us to share more. Um, one of them is who's owning these vehicles and what their incentives are. So at the moment, um, it's your average consumer who's buying a car. It takes them about 10 years to get through 150,000 kilometers. Um, there's no incentive for the automotive sector to make those vehicles last longer. You want people to be buying cars more frequently. Um, and after 10 years, they're probably corroded and they also aren't fashionable anymore. You want the latest model. And that's more and more true as they get more efficient, as they get uh, more tech attached to them. But if your uh, customer now becomes a fleet manager, a fleet owner like Uber, or you have vertical integration where they start to want to produce their own vehicles, um, they've got a huge incentive to do that because they're paying drivers now. Not enough, but they are paying drivers. So they want to reduce that cost um, and make their service more affordable, more effective. Um, they want to increase the lifetime of their asset as much as possible. So instead of having a vehicle that would last 150,000 kilometers, that might take them only a year to achieve that um, lifetime mileage. And it would seem ridiculous to replace your cars every year um, because all of the other components won't have worn out. So they're looking at things like the million kilometer car, um, increasing the robustness, or they can have much smaller vehicles that are suited to single occupancy journeys. Um, so you reduce the need to occupancy share because you've made much smaller vehicles. Um, so there's lots of ways in which um, connected autonomous vehicles will help <coughs> us to share and, and not worry too much about it. So once we do that, it introduces all of these other things that help to decrease the emissions and reset that balance. Uh, things like having better links to mass transit because you can have a one-way journey, then be connected to a train and not have to worry about leaving your car there um, and further way back. Um, you have things like right sizing, so those pods that you might see in a utopian future where everyone's traveling sing in singular form or they break apart as they turn corners. Um, reduction in land use, as we spoke about. So even if you just did time sharing and you reduce the fleet, you could reduce the fleet massively um, at any one time, and then you repurpose that land in cities um, for potentially 
um, greener uses and uh, potentially not. Um, <laughs> but this is where um, policy becomes really, really important. Um, if you incentivize the business models um, to increase sharing, uh, to increase the lifetime of a vehicle, um, to, re um, you know, to ensure that the automotive sector is moving towards um, automated, uh, automated business models um, that allow for this, then you can have a much more greener, more efficient, um, better for the customer, um, but crucially, a decarbonized transport system. And if you don't, we'll end up replacing, uh, for the uh, people that can afford it, replacing the cars that they've got now um, with a connected autonomous vehicle that is, uh, for their own private use, it's still taking up space, <laughs> it's doing empty miles, it's clogging up, um, creating congestion, um, and it's actually not that useful uh, for reducing carbon. I kind of want to leave you on um, a point in terms of this isn't just transport, this isn't just um, it, driverless cars. This is for kind of any technology that we consider. You can look at, a, zoom in on a certain element of the carbon life cycle and show reductions and show it really effectively. Um, you can make all the speeches you like about how the UK is leading in um, reducing carbon emissions. Um, but where are those carbon emissions going? What are you actually measuring? Um, and um, when you think about technology helping us, um, what's the behavior that might actually come out of that? How are humans going to respond and implement that technology? Um, and what are the policies that we can put in place to actually force that into a, a route that will be good for all? Um, so that's all from me. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> thank you very much. <laughs>
Yes, yes, definitely. So yeah, that was a really good question. So um, question was, um, drivers are idiots, machines aren't. Um, if um, you are driving better, you're going to have less wear, less maintenance, and that could extend the life of the vehicle. Um, is that taken into account in the life cycle? So yes. Um, so when we use this kind of idea to do modeling, um, we increase the lifespan slightly um, for those reasons that, yeah, you're not going to be um, recklessly driving it and ruining certain components. Also, there is a l evidence to suggest that electric vehicles last longer. They've got fewer moving parts in a motor compared to um, combustion engines. So there is a trajectory in improving um, that lifespan. Um, but with service vehicles, it's, um, it's hard because people vandalize them as well. So some of the um, elements will um, be better maintained and other elements that are more public facing wouldn't be. So again, that really depends on whether it goes down a, a service-based model um, like your Ubers or continues around private ownership um, where people would look after them better and then they would also be um, driven better as well and maintain a longer lifespan. There we go. Uh, this is kind of the opposite end of that question. So does the model take into account the evils of capitalism and forced obsolescence? <laughs> <laughs> like, like the notion that they might be making batteries that die sooner than they should because they want people to replace them. Is that built in there or is that? Yeah, well, so, okay. So the question <coughs> is, um, it, are the evils of capitalism included in the model um, <laughs> um, that yeah, they're forcing you to replace things? Yes. So the, the, f the, the f kind of fleet renewal cycle of every 10 years is it's a very simplified model because cars don't get, go into landfill after 10 years. They go to a different market where um, they're still worth something. So typically within the UK, cars will go to Eastern Europe. Um, then they might go to Africa, uh, then they might, um, then they'll be disposed of. So um, when you make things shinier and you make things, um, yeah, more tech driven, people want the latest thing. There's not a lot of difference between cars, you know, that are tw uh, like 10 years old and 15 years old, but actually um, a car now and a car in five years may be very, very different. And so that forces people to want to, to get the latest version. Um, again, um, fleet operators aren't really like that. Um, so if, if Uber become the customer, if the fleet manager becomes the customer, they are going to, you know, they have a fleet of Priuses and no one really cares if they're in um, a Prius or anything else. Um, whereas if, it, if you own it, then yeah, that all comes into account and then the manufacturers create batteries which don't last very long that they then can turn a switch and say, oh, oops, we did an update and now you can only got half the range. Um, but that, that comes into them wanting to um, produce a set number of vehicles every year. And to, in order to reduce the rate of manufacture, that's where policy needs to come in and allow a path that shows that they've got a market that they can sell, but that um, it's not force, forcing consumers to keep buying the latest version. And that's just, yeah, not going to, in any sector, that's only going to lead to greater consumption and more emissions. Thank you. We, we've gone 33 minutes uh, before the mention of evil capitalism, <laughs> which <laughs> is not a nerd night record by <laughs> any means. <laughs> Next time, try better. Uh, any more questions? There was one over there, yes. Uh, first here and then in the back. So you go first, the white t-shirt, yes. Okay. Um, so where do you think the sharing occupancy sharing model will come from? Rather from the private sector, or will it be more driven, or can it be more driven? Yeah, really good question. So the um, question is around um, occupancy sharing and whether the private sector can come in here or whether it's always going to be a public um, sector model that allows for occupancy sharing. I think there are lots of ways, well, there's lots of ways that public transport have tried to harness new technologies. So demand responsive transit um, has been trialled in lots of places in the UK, which is an in-between of a bus and uh, a kind of demand responsive taxi um, so they um, will pick various different people up in the route you might remember via van here um, that and city mapper tried their own um, routes and things like that um, it, it sort of doesn't work 
um, e either way at the moment. They haven't found a model that's efficient enough that actually it's adding on extra journey time for the people that do travel that way um, and it's not really reducing the cost. So they haven't found that in between that works. So I would suggest if um, if it's you're trying to actually remove cars from the road um, you need to get people to give up their vehicle so that you don't produce one per person um, that's the only way in which you can reduce the manufacturing rate if you do that um, then the occupancy sharing people don't really like public transport um, maybe some people here love the tube um, but people don't love sharing but they also the flip side of that is security and safety. Um, COVID put a whole spanner in the works in terms of wanting to be close to people, um, but also um, the safety element of if you've only got three people in a car, you probably feel a lot less safe than if you've got you know, 100 people on the tube uh, from a personal safety perspective. So there's a lot that needs to be done um, to offer people um, security in those situations. Um, I wouldn't say that's a complete blocker. It's, it's something that people use as a an excuse to kind of dismiss occupancy sharing. Um, but it's a very situational thing. Um, you know, during the night you might have different rules, you might have a different personal, um, um, like kind of safety threshold. In a new city you might want to travel on your own. Um, but that doesn't mean that it doesn't work for a lot of people a lot of the time. Um, so it's something that can definitely continue a, a, as a path. Um, Uber tried Uber Pool for for quite a while. I don't know if they actually still have that, but um, it, it, from my experience, it wasn't much cheaper. So they need to really reduce that cost to incentivize people to, to share. If it's half the price, you, you might well want to um, share a journey. Um, if it's one pound cheaper, you probably won't. I tried Uber Pool. Mm. I got a ride and chicken cottage. Yeah. <laughs> it was great. There was <laughs> one more behind. <laughs> Yeah, I was just going to ask about uh, lithium and the whole battery situation, which is, I mean, there might be other metals that are used there, but essentially, can, can we make enough batteries um, if we can't one of the alternatives? Um, what do we do about people who might not want to give up their battery materials? <laughs> Try to carry on. <laughs> um, yeah, really good question. So um, it's around kind of uh, rare earth metals, lithium. Um, do we have enough of them to produce the batteries that we need? Um, and how do we handle geopolitics of countries that aren't going to want to give us those raw materials? Um, yeah, so, I mean, everything kind of goes through cycles of, of metals or resources that we suddenly want more of. Um, we've seen it with kind of semiconductors and uh, materials around there. Copper was a huge one. Um, so they're rolling out um, telecommunications and the electricity grid. Um, it is starts to go into just basic economics of, well, it becomes more valuable because there's less of it and there's more of a demand. Um, and, but that means that they open more mining sites, they become more economically viable um, in places where it's harder to, to actually access it. So I don't think there's any, it kind of fluctuates, but I think there's not any major concerns that in the short term we would run out. Um, I don't think that battery electric vehicles in the way that we use cars now is the future. It's not a take all the cars we've got, replace them with batteries and we're fine and we're solved and we'll carry on forever. I do think it's a, a kind of stepping stone to um, <coughs> other future transport. Um, so in the, in the short term, um, it doesn't seem to be an issue. There's lots of other battery technologies. There's a lot of diversification between um, not just lithium, cobalt, um, nickel, various other metals as well that can um, deliver similar uh, performance. Um, so yeah, it's definitely something to monitor and it's something to concern yourself with. Um, but um, in the short term, it's not a, a clear blocker to energy pr uh, battery production. Any more questions? Okay, I was gonna say last one and make it good. Georgie will be here during the interval, so please swarm her and ask her all the questions. Last question over there. Is there a way for this occupancy sharing model to take into account the kind of access for rural communities? I'm thinking about like, how hard it is for me to get an Uber when I live in South London. Rural communities. Well, 
Well, first of all, congratulations on making it here tonight. I mean, <laughs> incredible. I don't she know if did anyone need can... a vaccination to cross the yeah, river. Yeah, if anyone can beat South London. Um, so <laughs> the question was, um, can these occupancy sharing models take into account rural communities such as Clapham? Um, <laughs> and, um, yeah, um, because it's very hard to get transport there. Um, yeah, so I guess in r rural communities... Um, <laughs> People's um, alternatives um, are, are less abundant. Um, so their expectations and their waiting time um, is, is kind of lower as well. So um, there is definitely ways in which demand response transport can work better sometimes in rural communities because um, it may be tending towards elderly communities or people that have quite structured commutes or structured things that they want to do. Um, and you know they've got a bus every two hours. So if you can improve on that, then um, actually it's a much, much better system. Um, and people are then happier to share um, if in a friendly village um, of Clapham. Um, <laughs> so yeah, it does, but um, it, it is a balance because um, you need kind of more vehicles available than you have demand at any one time for the service to be reliable and for people to go, do you know what, I actually don't need a car anymore because I know whenever I need one, it will be available to me. Um, and in a rural setting, that's probably never going to be the case um, that you could, um, you know, if something, well, I'm thinking not more like a zombie apocalypse where everyone needs to get out, but more um, you've got unprecedented demand that people want to travel and they don't feel that they can rely on that service. Um, but what it might do in rural communities is instead of having two, three, four cars in a household um, and the number of cars per household has risen every every year, um, is you'd, you'd only need one because you can travel in that vehicle to work where it would have been just... Um, just waiting in the car park for you to drive home. It can return, it can take your kids to school, it can come back again, it can help your neighbor out and give them the lift that you usually give them. It can then come back. So it can be um, a lot more versatile and useful to you. Um, so that's where private ownership of collector autonomous vehicles could be a really good thing. Um, but that's where time sharing comes into it. Um, and yeah, yeah, people, yeah, friendlier people who are willing to share. That, that was um, Tesla's model. Um, but I don't know how friendly the people are <laughs> by them. Um, but that was certainly, um, it was certainly their ambition, was that it's, it's not just your asset. Um, it will make you money while you're at work, because it can go and um, yeah, take other people around. Um, but they've sort of diverged from that now. I think Elon's busy, so. Well, thank you so much.